Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name's Edie, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I want to welcome all the the new people who stood up, and I want to welcome all the new people who didn't stand up. And uh, if there's anybody out there, I was, I'm so nervous. <laughs> my butt is in convulsion, so. And now my, <laughs> I'm not a circuit speaker and I'm not a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> I always wanted to be a lawyer. I thought I'd make a good lawyer. Uh, but I do want to welcome the new people and I want to let you know that that you're the, the lifeblood of this program, and that if you're new, what I hope is is that you stay here. Uh, and I want to uh, thank the committee for inviting me. I think they've done a great job, and uh, I've had a ball, a really a, a good time. Uh, I was a little nervous coming up here, and you know, uh, but I'm uh, ten times nervous today than I was on Friday. God, I can't believe. Can you believe this, butt? <laughs> I wear loose pants, so it doesn't, it isn't real obvious. Uh, my friend Kurt uh, gave me a note. Uh, on it, it says, uh, your name is Edie and you are an alcoholic. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, ha- I, I was thinking, you know, this morning I woke up with the, the pounding of the waves and, uh, and, and I was thinking about, uh, how loud the waves were. And I, I was thinking about the force of the storm and, Thinking, well, maybe, maybe they'll cancel this meeting. <laughs> but uh, we alcoholics, we don't do those sorts of things. And, uh, I'll get started here any minute. I want you to know that I'm not a circuit speaker. Uh, so then there's no, I absolutely don't know what I'm going to tell you. But I did get on my knees in the bathroom in front of a toilet. And I asked God to allow me to be real and not try to say anything that's going to impress you. And just talk from my heart. So I hope that's what happens. Uh, I uh, I was uh, born in San Jose. I'm not very far from here. And uh, I was I came from the kind of family they talk about in in, in the big book, uh, seeking lower companionship. Uh, I just kind of woke up as long as far as I could remember back, and they were just kind of. Uh, dysfunctional. I heard a speaker, and I want to say right now, because I I got sort of a lecture about cussing yesterday, uh, and what I want to say to you is if you are, you know, someone from the professional, if you're a professional and and you're here and and, uh, if I happen to cuss, I hope that doesn't keep you from coming back here, but the bottom line is is that I know I'm not that powerful. But uh, I got the lecture about how you shouldn't cuss if you're an AA and act like a lady. And uh, and the big book says that you talk to people in their in your language. And for me to share my experience, strength, and hope from, with you, I came from people that didn't have a uh, big vocabulary, and they were not goal-oriented. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to share with you what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. And what I can tell you, if you're new, that, that when I got here, my vocabulary was very limited, but I, I do have a c- occasion to cuss, and I don't know when that's going to happen. So, well, we're talking about a whole lot of stuff here, but uh, I had my first drink when I was uh, little. I want to tell you a little bit more before I get to that. Uh, you know, uh, I'm always really, 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 really grateful to be able to come and share in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I'm, uh, my mother is Mexican Indi- and Indian. Uh, her, her maiden name is Valdez. And uh, I'm the only sober Valdez ever <laughs> in my family. That I'm sure there's some other Valdezes somewhere just in my little section of Valdezes. I'm the only one sober. And uh, we, we are uh, California Indian, and uh, they didn't give us anything. They didn't give us a whole lot of money, but they did give us a small burial plot in San Juan Batista. Uh, and what I want you to know is most of the members of my family are there in, in the cemetery. And one of those members is my mother. Oh, it's 
going to be one of those mornings. My mom never made it to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't even know if she ever heard that there was Alcoholics Anonymous. So for me to be able to stand here and share with you is a miracle for me. And I feel very, very uh, fortunate that I have been given the gift of sobriety and that I've been asked to come here and share with you. Uh, so, you know, I, I uh, always, when I get around this area, I get very emotional because uh, it, it brings back, you know, thinking about, I didn't know much about my mother and I didn't know much about my family because after my mother died, my dad gave me away to the member, a member of the family who didn't live around my family. She was sort of shunned from the family and, uh, actually she, uh, we, uh, I was given to, uh, my mother married a white man. And, and, and the Valdez has always believed that you shouldn't marry out of, out of your race. And, uh, when my mother committed suicide, uh, they blamed my father. So my father, in order to get back at, at them, he took me and I have a little brother and, uh, by the name of Joaquin, uh, and they, they gave us to, he gave us to this woman who was in her chronic stages of alcoholism, and her name was Mary, and she was a cousin of mine. So I grew up in uh, San Francisco, Alameda, and Oakland most of the time in low-income housing. Uh, ma- m- the majority of the time we, we lived out in the Fillmore District in San Francisco. Uh, I came from one of those uh, places that uh, it's kind of like being in a prison, that kind of environment where you know you absolutely know who belongs there and who doesn't. Uh, when I... Uh, I, I always had, I came from having an incredible amount of shame. Uh, school was not a, a festive experience for me. Uh, I didn't do well in school. I don't know why. Uh, you know, you go to school and they're wanting to talk about the, you know, the, the capital of Ecuador and, you know, the evening that I had was probably full of somebody beating the shit out of each other and, uh, throwing Chinese food across the room or, or something like that. You know, uh, Mary preferred sailors. That's why I guess we stayed so close to Alameda and San Francisco, a lot of sailors there. And uh, uh, growing up, uh, I, uh, I learned how to panhandle. I used to panhandle down on Union Square, and I used to, when, the, when it was big in the hippie era, I used to sell Hey Dashbury News. I got it, you need it, you buy it, you read it, only a dime. Best gam I ever had. I couldn't figure out what the hippies were doing. I didn't understand free love and peace and all that stuff because I was only like 12 years old. But, you know, what I really enjoyed was all the people that would drive through downtown Haight-Ashbury to look at the freaks. And it was like bumper to bumper from Wisconsin and South Dakota. And, you know, they would come to look at the hippies. And there was this hippie who made this paper. And I only had to sell it for a dime to these people. And I walked right down the middle of the street because it was bumper to bumper. And I would sell these newspapers. And uh, they would ask questions about the hippies, and I would just tell them, you know, I don't really know. And But they always always felt sorry for me and gave me a dollar for the paper, you know. And, and what I would do at the end of the day is I would pay the guy the dime, and then I would go buy old do- old donuts because there was all these girls and, and people coming from Kansas to experience this free love thing, but they didn't know how to eat. They didn't know how to survive because they came from, like, farms and stuff, and they came to the city. Why in the hell am I telling you this? This has nothing to do with drinking. But it was really, it, it was kind of exciting. You know, I look back at, at my childhood and, and, and it was like, you know, there was nobody, nobody really, part of it was exciting and part of it was kind of sad. The exciting part is, is nobody cared when I came home. There was no curfew. There was, you know, we did not have uh, meals on a scheduled, you know, like, nobody noticed when I wasn't there for dinner. Uh... We didn't have, like, uh, I don't know, remember in the early 60s when hush puppies were, like, the coolest thing in the whole world? And it was like, I would die for a pair of hush puppies. But I didn't. I didn't have hush puppies. We got those Safeway tennis shoes, you know, from Safeway, and the bottoms could make it through an atomic bomb, but the tops always wore out, right? And I'm still talking about nothing that has to do with drinking. So... I didn't forget my note, my beads. Yeah, that'll do it. it it's it's all right. It's going to be okay. I mean, this is spontaneous. You know, my my butt's not shaking anymore. So my sponsor always told me, all I have to do is get dressed, and God will do the rest. And I think like God's kicking in here. You know, we're not. You know, we're not going. There's no. Um, I don't have. If you're new. I don't have a program up here. Shit, I wished I did. Uh, 
But I can tell you that Alcoholics Anonymous has changed my life. And maybe someday I'll be able to stand up here and just, just wing it right off and have no pauses, and maybe they'll just quit asking me to do this. Hell, I don't know. <laughs> but, you, but you know, uh, things that happened to me is like, uh, I had a bad attitude when I got here. I had a real, real bad attitude. And I need to share uh, this for the new people, because, you know, I had a little problem with surrender when they talked about the steps. And, you know, you need to surrender to a power greater than yourself. And, you know, at what age, you know, at somewhere... In my life, I went away. You know, I don't know how old I was. You know, how old was I when I quit trusting? You know, I can't tell you how old I was when I quit trusting. But somewhere, I went away. And I don't know when it was. But when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was 25 years old and I was real wounded. And it's been real hard for me. And when I stand in front of you and I need to tell you what it was like, sometimes it's difficult because there's a lot of different things that took place. Uh, I can tell you when I was six or seven years old, uh, I li- you know, I told you I lived in, in the low-income housing area, and you know who lives there and who doesn't live there. And I had this bad habit of, of scraping gum off the ground and chewing it. And I did it, you know, I'd, I'd, ch- I'd chew gum off the, off the ground, and I would eat the tops of matches. I don't know why I did that, because somebody told me not to do that. You know, they say we get here, we're really sick. I was a really sick one, even when I was little. And I had this nickel, and I was down, and I was scraping up this big old wad of bozo. And here come this lady, kind of heavy set lady, walking towards me, you know. And, you know, I looked at her, and I knew that, that she was a social worker, parole officer, Avon lady. She had to be something, but she didn't live there. You just know those kinds of things. You just know. And she came up to me, and she said, little girl. Why don't you take that nickel and go buy yourself some gum? And I looked up at that lady and I said, because I want to chew this gum, that's why. I was six or seven. And uh, I had trouble with surrender. Uh, <laughs> and and, and it kind of every year it kind of got progressively worse, you know. And uh, I got here in 1980. Uh, I want you to know that the last time I had a drink was July the 11th, 1983, and that's the last time that I found it necessary to use or drink anything. But you notice there's 80 and 83, so for three years there was this, there was this void. There was this time of, of, uh, and it was the most painful time of my life. Uh, and I'm not gonna get to that. Um, First I'm gonna tell you about my first drink. I had my first drink not very far from here. Well, it is maybe, I don't know, maybe it's 70, 80 miles away from here, a little town right out of Hollister. Uh, it tr- trusts Pinos, uh, Three Pines. It's a little town out of Hollister. Every time I say everybody thinks that when I say trust Pinos, they think I'm saying three penises, and I'm not. It's three pines, you know. <laughs> but there's not much in this little town. But there is a bar called the 19th Hole, and it's still there. And I don't know about any of the rest of you, but I, I grew up with the kind of alcoholics that used to like to get in cars and drive to old beat up bars. Uh, is there anybody here that had those kind of parents or lived with people that said that they're going to go in for a quick one, they'd be right out? Right? You know, and about four hours later they'd show up with a bag of peanuts and a Coke and call it dinner. So I'm like nine or ten years old and you know what kind of attitude I had when I was six, you know, that I, cause I want to. And I'd watch those people, you know, you learn how to mimic the people that you grow up with. And uh, they used to always pull that bottle from out from underneath the seat, and they'd, they'd take the lid off of the bottle, and they would they would kick it back, and they'd take a big old swig off that whiskey, and they'd pass it to the other person in the car, and they'd take a big old swig, and I would, ah, you know, and and uh, put the lid and slip it back under the seat, you know. And, uh, and I don't know how many times I, I had observed that, watched that behavior. But, you know, after you're in the car for four or five hours, what they want you to do is they come out and tell you to lay down in the car. Because, you know, authorities and, you know, you know, police, people kind of worry about kids hanging out in cars after four or five hours. So they used to have us lay down in the seat so nobody would notice that we were there. And uh, I wasn't having a great day. Uh, you know, and I reached underneath the seat and I felt that bottle and, you know, I sat up in the seat and I pulled out that bottle and it was a bottle of Seagram 7, you know, the one with the real fancy label, the embossed 7 in red and gold and a lot of money they spend, I've noticed later on, for that printing of that label. 
And uh, there was about this much in that, that flat brown bottle. And I cranked off the lid, and I kicked it back, and I took my very first drink of alcohol. Uh, I don't know about anybody, about whiskey drinkers, there's any whiskey drinkers in here, but it's really burns, kind of like it came out of my tear ducts, and I felt like it came out of my ears and, and out of my nose, and it's like it sucked the, lo- <gasps> the wind right out of me, you know, like took it all out of me. And I'm like, God, I'm sitting there, I think I'm going to die. I don't know if I need to puke. I don't know if I can't breathe. And uh, But, you know, I felt it burn all the way down into my gut. And I think what happened in that moment is what happens only for alcoholics. You know, in that moment, what happened for me is a magic took place. You know, I got that warm feeling. It just kind of went into the pit of my gut, and then it just kind of spread all over my body. And I felt warm all over, and I didn't care. I didn't care that that they gave me a way to the, you know, that that lady that I had that nickel experience with uh, about the, the gum? Well, she thought I was so cute, she went and found Mary, my cousin, and and, and told Mary she thought I was cute, so Mary gave me to her. Right? Oh, go ahead and take her. I, you know, you know, you think I have abandonment issues? You know, uh, uh, I remember, I remember her taking me, and I was driving across. You know, we were riding in the, across the Bay Bridge, and I was in this car with this woman, and I don't know who this woman is. And I thought to myself, you know, I mean, we learn. You know, people think that kids don't know, but kids know. I mean, I knew that they just gave me away to a complete stranger. You know, and I wondered, well, I thought things like, did they get her address? Did they plan on coming and get me? You know, and uh, this is a few years later. What Mary found out is that if I was not living with her in the, in the house, she, 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 couldn't, she couldn't get any money for me. So I remember the day, you know, this lady, I, you know, I don't even know where this woman is today. This woman and her husband, he was a, he was a fireman, and... It was the strangest thing. You know, I'd never been around anything, like, consistent. And they went out and bought me these Donald Duck sheets for this little bed. And they got Flintstones vitamins. And I had grape juice. And every day he'd come home from work and he'd take my little hand and he'd walk me to the store and he would buy a paper. And then one day I heard her crying and telling her friends they're coming to get Edie because she can't get any money unless Edie's living with them. And I remember going up to this lady and saying, whatever you do, don't let her see you cry. Don't let her see you cry. Because I knew, somehow my mind thought, that if you show emotion, and if you cry, then they win. Somebody wins. You know, and I was like, at this time I was really getting good at being tough. Goes back to that part of where, where, where do we go away? And where do we go away? You know, when do we start putting on those shells? And, uh, so when I was nine years old and I had my first drink, I had some relief. It was like for the first time in my life, I felt like I fit in. I didn't care that I was sitting in this old beat-up Ford by this bar. I didn't care. I felt good. I mean, I felt really good. Alcohol and drugs worked for me for a long, long time. God, I'm going to get on a more positive note here any minute. Jesus Christ. God, I need a drink of water or something, you know. Yeah, water. That'll do. Um, So, my God, I had no idea I'd get this in depth. God has a sense of humor. Well, I'm being real. (laughs) It's one thing I can do. I know what I'm going to learn how to do. I'm going to recite that big book, so all I can do is quote it. (laughs) Never tell you a thing, but I'll quote the goddamn big book. Uh... (laughs) Oh, my God. There comes that bad attitude. You know, I swear to God. <laughs> no, how, you know, how, much, how long you work at this thing, you know? It's like, I asked God, you know, I had this man tell me over, you know, I was in the, that little, uh, that area where they sell the tapes and the jewelry, and this guy said to me, oh, you brought me some tissue. Oh, paper towels. That's great. Uh, he said, he said, you know, I, I heard you talk once, so, oh, and I don't remember where, where he said he heard me talk, and... And I said, oh, I always say, oh, because I don't know what they're going to say. And he said, yeah, I didn't like you in the beginning because you sounded so angry. But for some reason, I stayed, and in the end, I I got it. 
And I said, thanks. You know, and when I said my prayers this morning, what I did is I asked God to allow me not to be so afraid when I share to you, because when I get afraid, I get kind of cocky. And when I get kind of cocky, I have this uncanny ability to force rejection. I force rejection. You know, I, I, there's somebody in, in, uh, one of the AA meetings I went to, and he was a young guy, and he had a, 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 a thing through his nose, and he had a bobby pin in his cheek, and he was talking to me about why people won't allow him to be him and why they weren't accepting him. And, you know, I looked at him and said, God, I don't know. I'm just a carpenter. I don't have a clue. You know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, people that are new come here and think we really know something. It's like, hey, if you want to nail it, screw it, or glue it, I really know how to do that. But uh, but he turned and he walked away from me and he had on a Levi jacket. And on the back of this jacket, I could not believe what the black back of this jacket said. It said, vaginal blood farts. And he's wondering why people don't want to get close to him, you know. So, so I, came, I walked up to him kind of gently and said, you know, when we were talking earlier, uh, I hadn't noticed your jacket. And uh, when I was real new, uh, I was real hostile and I was real angry and, and people didn't want to get close to me uh, because of my anger and my hostility. And every time somebody would tell me I was angry, it made me that much more angry. And I said, but I really believe that that jacket is like, is keeping people away. Uh, and, and I don't know, you know, if he got it, but that's the magic of what happens here. We get to watch each other. See, by seeing his jacket, what I got to see is I got to see a little bit more of me. A little bit more of me, because see, I got here and I was so afraid, uh, that, uh, you know, when I grew up, I grew up in a lot of foster homes. I, after a while, Mary, uh, the woman that I lived with, you know, for 10 years, I lived with that woman. My little brother and I lived with that woman. And she was, uh, she was in the chronic stages of alcoholism. And she kind of took my hand and my little brother's hand. And we got to walk for 10 years. We got to walk through what a woman alcoholic to the depths of where alcoholism takes a woman alcoholic. And I got to watch the things that a woman alcoholic will do in the depths of this disease. And, uh, you know, I remember when I was, I must have been, it was right after my first drink, you know, and I started drinking and stuff. And I remember thinking to myself, there are three things I don't want to be. You know, I developed some goals in there. I got some goals. And I started getting goal-oriented. And I knew that I didn't want to be a whore. I knew I didn't want to be an alcoholic. And I knew I didn't want to live in a fort. You know, I felt good about that. You know, uh, I didn't come from the kind of background where you thought about being PhDs, attorneys, lawyers. If you couldn't, if you made it and didn't become a whore, you were doing good. You know, and and that's the reality of where I came from. You know, I mean, my goals today don't look anything like like they they did in the beginning. You know, and uh, you know, I, I I felt honored to be uh, included in this program with June G. Um, I was at the Spring Fling in 1980, and I had six hours sober. And June was the main speaker. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, she came from such a place. Maybe if I give this thing Alcoholics Anonymous a chance, maybe it'll work in my life, too. Maybe it'll work in my life, too. And it's eight years later, and as I go on a little bit and get into my story a little deeper about what's actually happened, you'll see that it has worked in my life. No, I'm not an attorney, but, you know, I mean, I've come from a, a long ways, you know. When I was a little kid, all I wanted to do was just dig my way out of that goddamn sewer, you know. And uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous in the steps and a, a power working, a power greater than myself working in my life has, has changed my life. It hasn't been easy, you know. Jesus Christ, I wish I could get some consistency. I keep forgetting where I am. You know, like, where, where was I just at before I was talking about Mary? There's, there, you know, you have to have a method to this madness to get through it. This pisses people off when I do this. I always tell me, I wish you'd just... Yeah. I was living in a Ford. Yeah, okay, I got out of the Ford. We moved on. God's taking a break. I'm having vapor lock in my brain. Uh, when I was 13 years old, uh, I hadn't seen my father for 10 years, and uh, 
Mary had, uh, her disease had progressed and, and you know, we had, li- we had been living in Watsonville in a, in a, in a real, she was working in a bar below this old hotel and she was doing chains of, she was, it was bad. Let's just put it that way. It was bad. We lived in a motel room where there was a mattress on the floor and there's artichoke crates for furniture. And I used to watch her crawl across the floor for a bottle of wine just to keep the sick off of her. And I used to have such shame for her. And it was around that time that I don't know where he came from, but um, my father, I was staying with my grandmother's second husband, my Uncle Melton, Uncle Melton Alviso. He was taking a drink and had a stroke, fell off the back of a bar stool and decided to quit drinking. My family, there's some stories in that family. Uh, anyhow, we were living with Uncle Melton. He was on disability because he only half of one side of his body worked and the other side just kind of drug along from the stroke. And, you know, uh, we had, uh, we eat a lot of beans and fried eggs and on Wednesdays we'd have meat. And here comes my dad. I haven't seen my dad in 10 years and my dad drives up in a pretty, pretty new Buick. He has a new wife. He has on one of those three-piece suits that kind of changed colors. It was like 69 or 70. It was one of those three-piece suits. It's kind of green, but if the light hit it, it turned kind of blue, you know, kind of, kind of, he was a, he was a slick guy, you know. And he had his wife when they had a, she had a mink coat on and she had diamonds all over and she had on a, a watch, you know, with diamonds and, and I immediately copped an attitude. I don't know why, just kind of copped an attitude. I was judgmental in those days. Uh, here we are living with Melton, eating beans and fried eggs, and here comes my dad and his new wife and all these diamonds. And my my mom, my new mom, my new new stepmother says, uh, "Aren't you gonna hug your daddy?" <laughs> like I'm 13, full of hate, and going on 40 is like, forget you. I didn't say that. I, I used to use the F word a lot. Uh, it worked really well on social workers, intake counselors. Uh, you know, I remember when I was about 12 years old, I had a, a, a psychologist. Uh, uh, we were in a holding home because Mary was put in jail, and this uh, psychologist, big, big, heavyset guy with a, his his head was always perspiring, the, the top of his head and his lips and everything. And, and he used to ask me these silly questions. And after asking me all these silly, stupid questions, he looked at me and told me, "You're a very, very angry little girl." And you're going to spend the majority of your life incarcerated in prison because you have the inability to adapt. And I thought, what a smart son of a bitch. What a smart guy. And, I, you know, the other thing that I noticed after I got sober and, and started working a little a program, a little program of recovery, a program of recovery, I realized the sad thing about all of that is in all those holding homes and all those people and all those social workers, there's never one person had ever told me, not one person had ever said to me, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to live like that. I had another social worker say to another social worker in my presence, isn't it too bad she's kind of a cute little girl? It's too bad she's going to be just like Mary when she grows up. Just like Mary when she grows up. And I thought to myself, I'm going to show you, lady. And I thought when I got sober, is that how God works in our lives? See, I had a lot of problems with God. See, I started trying to search back, had God ever worked in my life? And I think that the very day that that woman said that, I was going to show that lady that that was God working in my life. See, that's my concept. See, we, we come here, and if you're new, you can get your own concept of God. But, you know, when I look back, if it hadn't been for me wanting to show that lady that I could do it differently, would I be here today? I don't know. You know, I don't know. You know, I don't know a lot. I lost my train of thought again. But we're, we're my dad and my new stepmom are there, and uh, we go to live in San Jose. On that, and and uh, in those days, any of you from San Jose, it was there was a new uh, housing development on the end of Story Road, little track houses out there on the end of Story Road. And I'd never been in a track home that I could remember. I, at the time, I didn't think it was a track home. It looked like the Taj Mahal to me. Uh, we walked in. There's like four square feet of marble. And... Uh, God, my God, they had white carpet in the living room, and they had a grand piano. And I thought, my God, I'm living with millionaires. And, uh, you know, first time we sat down to eat dinner, my, my stepmom had a big big stack of white bread on the table. And uh, I took the, I took a, 
You know, I don't believe this. Let's flip this woman out. She's from Houston, Texas, and she hates Mexicans. So I didn't know that until I took this piece of rainbow white bread and squished it all up, squished it all up, and made myself a little tortilla, kind of tore it up, and then, like, grabbed a bunch of peas or something and, and started eating it. She flipped out, like, flipped out. She got up, and her, like, chair fell out. She flipped out, telling me, you know, a heathen Mexican. You eat like a heathen Mexican. Yeah, you're going to get away from this table. And, and uh, God... You know, I remember just sitting there, just bewildered, like, oh, my God, what did I do? And, uh, you know, and it's like I made sure that whenever I was in the presence of that woman, that I ate like a heathen Mexican. But I also want you to know that I was two years sober. I was two years sober before I could sit in a restaurant and eat alone. So the damage, you know, the damage takes place. And I respond to the damage. And I respond to it. But you know what? I believed her. I was two years sober. And I wanted to go out and have a nice meal. But there wasn't anybody around. And I said, well, Edie, you know, they say that that in AA we can do anything. And I bet you could go into a restaurant and sit down and eat all by yourself. And so what I did is I got on my knees and I said the third step prayer. I got dressed and I went to this restaurant in Sacramento called Nicole's. And they have cloth, tablecloths, and they have cloth napkins. And I sat down and took the napkin and put it on my lap. And I chewed with my mouth closed. And I didn't eat like a heathen Mexican. And I went from the dinner, I went to my home group, and I cried and I talked about what that felt like. That's how the programs worked in my life. I've learned how to to eat. I knew how to eat, but I didn't believe that I knew how to eat. You know, I don't have a whole lot of words of wisdom. All I have is my experience. And, uh, God, I just can't believe the stuff I'm talking about today. Oh, shit. Oh, my God, I'll have another drink of water. Jesus. Jesus. You know, you, you wonder, I'm laying in bed this morning, and I'm thinking I can hear the, the pounding of the waves. And uh, and I thought about the force, you know, and, and a friend of mine came up here with me, and she was standing, and she was holding her hands against the glass. And she goes, God, I can't believe. Come and feel this. And I and I went over, and I put my hands on the glass, and you could feel the, the force of the wind. And I stood there, and I had my hands against the glass, and I thought to myself, and I ever doubted the power of God. I doubted the power of God. You know, I, w- I was talking to some people I just met from Arizona over here, and and uh, I was t- we were talking about a lot of things. You know, I'm going on vacation to Arizona. Three alcoholics are going on vacation to, Al- to Arizona. Can you imagine? They said, where are you going? And then my friend Mark said, well, she's going here. And my mind says, no, I want to go here. And I know the other one wants to go here, right? Three alcoholics going to Arizona. And uh, and we started talking, you know, because that's what's so neat about people in AA, we, we, we kind of open up, we look and see, oh, he's got a tag, oh my God, they're alcoholics, <laughs> how wonderful, and I, and I was sharing with them about uh, this sticker that I saw in the casino in Tahoe, you know, we have these, all these AA slogans, live and let live, think, 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 and all that, and there's a few more, only for, I can't even think of them, God, but this one I think would be perfect, I think it would be perfect, it was on the end of a, a row of, of uh, slot machines, and it said, you must be present to win. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> and I thought that what a, we should take that sticker and send it to central office in New York and say, "Can we're the young people's young people in California, and we've come up with a new slogan. <laughs> you must be present to win." See, when they started talking about God and surrender and the steps, I couldn't feel God. So if you're new, the difference is today I can stand in a motel room and put my hands against the glass and know that that force that's coming is is so much greater than me. And the things that's happening and the storm and all of that, and I always doubted, you know. I mean, I always doubted God. I always felt like, you know, I had this feeling that somebody was saying at dinner last night, this woman was speaking, she said that she wanted to meet God and you know, sit down and talk to him because, you know, God had given her such a bum rap in life. And when I got here, I had that feeling. 
I had that feeling of, you know, it, it was so painful and it was so, so just, it was so much to just endure, you know, and when I was little, all I wanted to do was die. You know, the thing that saved my life was that first drink. The thing that saved my life was that first drink because, see, alcohol gave me an out for a long time and I didn't have to feel. I didn't have to feel anything. And then when I got sober, when I started to get sober, when I tried to get sober, you, you go into AA and then you quit using everything. And in about four days, oh, my God, stark raving reality sets in, you know. And you're like, I'm sitting in these meetings and I can't stand to be in my own skin. And, I, and I'm feeling all these emotions. And somebody walk up to you and say, how long do you have? You know, 24 days. Oh, you're right on schedule. You know? You always, you always hear that, right on schedule. And I think, you know, who has the schedule? I want to take a look at it. You know? I want to know where I'm going. You know, uh, you know, I drank and used for a long time. I, you know, I was, uh, I was, a, I was a, a puking blackout drinker. Uh, I, I didn't ever get a, 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 a DUI. It's not because I didn't drive drunk. You know, and a lot of times, there was, a lot of times, there's two occasions that I found the registration to my car and all on my passenger seat now, chances are it was pulled over. I don't remember being pulled over. And the thing that scares me is what did I do to get out of it? I can't tell you because I don't know. Those are the things that we bring here. The unknowns. And they scare us. So I went to my first, first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because my little brother took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. He got out of the VA hospital. He came to live with me. I was living in a little town called Merced over in the Central Valley. And he came to live with me and he said, Edie, you know, uh, the, in, at the uh, VA hospital, they have me on an abuse. And the only way I can get into an AA meeting is, uh, if you take me, uh, a blood member in your fl- family, only a blood member in your family can take you to AA. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I'd never heard of AA in my whole, you know, and all, growing up with all those alcoholics and all that, I never heard about, I ne- had never heard about AA. And uh, so I thought, well, God, the least I can do is help him straighten his life out. So I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I thought it was the most peculiar thing I'd ever seen in my whole entire life, the way people act in AA. Uh, I'd had a few beers that night. Well, because I, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm just taking him because he's on an abuse. You know, you go in there, and, and, and if you're new, they, they send around, you know, I'm sure you've been there where they send around the sign-in sheet. And uh, you must remember that I grew up in, in uh, the system. And the system is, you know, like the welfare food and the food stamps is all contingent on how many people are in your family. You know, they used to, in the early 60s and 70s, they used to give, give away canned pork and some of that real, you know, sort of gourmet stuff. Uh, so I have this mind, this mind thinks like that. And, uh, I go into this AA meeting and everybody's signing in, but they're only signing in like, you know, Joe W or, you know, Margie G or whatever. So I thought, well, of course they sign in like that because they turn this into the social worker, kind of like the social worker that told me that I would never be anything. And then that social worker would probably give you your government issue of coffee. That's how I think. I don't think you're buying your own coffee. I'd never been to AA. So I signed my name, but I signed it Edith Francis Cartwright because I'm not an alcoholic and I don't want anybody to think I'm alcoholic, so only alcoholics don't give their real name. So uh, then the meeting goes on, and this guy starts to share, and he says, my name's John, and I'm an alcoholic, and everybody in the room screamed, hi, John, Scream back at this guy, and I'm sitting there like, God, you know, the hell. And I thought, well, poor John probably can't remember his name. So they screamed back at John. So, so John would remember his name. And, uh, and then I realized that they did that with everyone. You know, so I couldn't, I don't know. You know, to tell you the truth, to this day, I don't know why we do that. Does anybody know why we do that? We say our name and I'm sure there's something. It's probably acknowledge that we're alcoholic or something. There's probably, we, we should find out what, why we do that. But, but I thought it was interesting, and then I thought it was real interesting when they called on Edith Francis Cartwright. And uh, have you ever been in a meeting who somebody signed in their first, middle, and last name? I would call on him in a New York heart, heartbeat. I'd call him, who's this, you know? 
some grandiose alcoholic, you know. So, um, so they called on me, and I proceeded to tell them, oh, no, 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 no. This, this is my brother, Joaquin, and um, he's on an abuse, and he's an alcoholic. And I came here because you wouldn't let him come here uh, because he's on an abuse. And I went into this whole long story about why I was there. And so then what happened is at the end of the meeting, they didn't pay any attention to him. They came up to me with, with, with all these uh, numbers, told me to keep coming back. About halfway home, I figured it out. That damn ungrateful brother of mine trying to tell me, I, oh, I was disgusted. You know, I had a car. You know, I had a job most of the time. How could he think, how could he do such a thing to me? And how could he do such a thing to me? You know, and I want you to know that uh, that was my first meeting, and I, and I went in and out a lot. And I want you to know that my brother didn't get this program. My brother didn't get this program. And he continued to go in and out of programs all over the country. And I got a, I got a feeling in my stomach about a year and a half ago to call, try to find my brother, and he's living, he was living in Montana, and I don't know what it was. I woke up, and I didn't feel good. I felt kind of sick, and, and I said, I called in work, and I said, I, you know, I'm not coming in. I don't feel good, and I just kind of, like, laid in bed and watched I Love Lucy, and kind of, I was restless and discontent, and so I called Billings, Montana, and I got the police department, and I said, uh, by any chance, do you have a, a Joaquin chain, a Joaquin chain cart ride in custody? And they said, yes, we do. And I said, did you pick him up for a drunk driving or drunk in public? And they said, no. And I said, well, can you tell me what you picked him up for? And they said, yeah, well, he was picked up for kidnapping, rape, assault, and robbery. And I said, thanks. You know, and I, I hung up the phone and I thought, you know, why God? Why did, did I get taken to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? And why am I sober? And why is he? And it isn't, it isn't about why. It's about we all choose different paths. You know, we all take different paths. My brother was just sentenced to 30 years. And he's in, uh, dear, dear, dear something. He's in a prison in Montana. Dear Lodge, Montana. But my brother is sober. He's sober. A little bit of forced recovery there. Uh, but he doesn't have to be sober. And we started developing a relationship on the phone. He calls me and, and we write and he's really excited and he's taking classes and he's up for a parole in five years. If he's a model, a model prisoner he can get out so if you knew when you're here what I ask is that you stay here and my experience is, is that I came here and I didn't stay here and I went back out and I went when you're here what I ask is that you stay here and my experience is, is that I came here and I didn't stay here and I went back out and I went I went in and out and in and out and it, it gets worse if you know, if, you, if I have anything to offer you today, it's hope. It's, it isn't easy. You know, it isn't easy getting sober. It isn't easy learning how to tell people what's really going on in your life. It isn't easy working the steps. But the alternative is, the alternative is what happened to my brother. Or worse. See, this is a, this is a incredibly patient disease. And, uh, you know, what can happen in your life is almost, is unbelievable. You know, it's unbelievable. I mean, to be even here standing in front of you from where I was in 1980 listening to June G, the speaker last night, and you know, where she talked about coming from, and I thought, you know, there were some similarities in our childhood, and I thought, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. If she can do it. Ability to trust that I couldn't even sit in a room. I couldn't even sit in a room with you unless I was loaded because I didn't know how to trust. I had the inability to trust. 
The last, last drunk I had, I was at the medical center in Sacramento on Stockton Boulevard. I had IVs in my arms. I had hoses down my nose, and they weren't treating me very nice, and I had blood all over me, and some of my very best friends had taken me there that night, and I was having, I was in uh, alcoholic convulsions. And uh, that was three years after I had come to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they talk about those yets and those things that can happen. But see, I was so nickel slick and full of hate, I never thought they would happen to me. See, I never thought they would happen to me. And there I lay in the medical center, you know, with, in, look, looking really, I don't know how I looked. I felt really bad. And uh, the doctor looked down at me and said, Edith, what happened to you? And this is classic. I kind of looked at the doctor. I thought for a moment, and I looked at the doctor, and I said, I just had a bad batch of potato salad. <laughs> now, if you're new, you probably hear a lot about denial. Uh, and that was denial. But I haven't, drink, I haven't had a drink or any mind-altering drug since that time. I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I was willing to do anything that they told me to do. Clean ashtrays, mop up pee. I used to, my home group, they used to have these winos that would stand at the coffee thing and just pee. Just stand there and pee. So we had a mop detail. And uh, I was on that for a while. And, uh, you know, when I was, uh, I, w I got out of treatment and I heard this woman uh, talk in San Jose and her name was Grady O'Hara. It was the first woman I'd ever heard cuss and, and, and talk the way that I had, I was used to hearing women talk and, and I, and I thought to my, I thought to myself, I, if I could get that woman to be my sponsor, maybe I could get this thing. So I was living in Modesto at the time, so I moved to Sacramento so that Grady would be my sponsor. I didn't know that I was going to any lengths. I didn't know that I was going to any lengths. See, I was a little bit foggy when I got here. And, you know, sometimes it's still real foggy for me. It's still real foggy. But I came to, I moved to Sacramento so Grady would sponsor me, and, and uh, I started doing what she told me to do, and, you know, my life started changing. It, it started changing a lot, you know, and I got involved in service. They didn't let me do much in service, clean ashtrays and stuff like that. My, my sponsor made me go down and get, uh, she asked me what kind of deodorant I used, shampoo and anything like that. And I told her, basically, what I didn't really have a brand. But she told me to go out and buy brands that I'd never used before. I had to buy a brand of deodorant I'd never used. I had to buy a brand of toothpaste I'd never used. And she said, that's just the beginning of you to realize that you're going to have to change everything about your life. And if you change the toothpaste and the deodorant and the shampoo, that that's the beginning. And I thought it was kind of silly at that time. But I realized today that that's how remedial I was when I got here. You know, I, I just, it took me a while to, to get through it, to be able to, to take the program. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not one of these people that's going to stand up here and, and go through steps one, two, three, four, you know, go like that. But what I hope you can see, if you're older, if that you're new, that in my sharing of my story, how the steps and the, and the principles are woven into my life. And if you're new, the, the, the steps and the fellowship it, it is very, very important. Uh, you know, I got here and I was, uh, unemployable. Uh, I got out of high school, uh, I got out of high school and I couldn't type, I didn't read well, and I couldn't spell. So I couldn't be a secretary. So I joined the Carpenters Union. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, kind of an alcoholic thing to do, but uh, I joined the Carpenters Union. I know I, I, know I don't look like a carpenter. Uh, but you know what happened is I, I, have a, I have the gift of being able to work with my hands. And I don't, you know, I don't know where I got that, but I do have the gift of working with my hands and figuring out how things go together. And uh, in 1979, I turned out as a journeyman carpenter in, the un in a union. And uh, I went through uh, schools. And, you know, you have to go to school for four years, and you have to pass all these tests. And I had gone to Skillaramas, and I'd won awards for being the best apprentice in my union, in my uh, local. And I, I felt really good about that. You know, even in the, in the drinking and the using and all of that. God, I feel like I'm just boring you all to fucking tears. Uh, this is so awful. This part's so awful. It's like, you know, what do I, t sometimes, you know, this, I wonder why I do this. I know I have something to say, you know. Thanks, thanks. 
<laughs> you see, you intuitively knew that I needed to be accepted. God, I mean, do we ever get to that plane, to that plateau of, I'm so well, I don't care if anybody likes me. God, I'd love to meet that. There goes a the guy right there, Michael. You know, uh, uh, so here I am. You know, I got to tell you, when I was like 17 days sober, I'm 17 days sober, and I have a little bit of an attitude, kind of a little bit of an attitude at 17 days sober, because I don't have any money. And I, reds do. Rent and PG&E and all that stuff do. Margie, you look like you're bored out. My best friend's sitting over here like this, you know. Um, and so my, my roommate at the time, who's like my adopted sister, said, Edie, how about we go out and wash windows? Wash windows? Can you imagine washing windows? I'd never wash windows. But I said, fine. So we went to the most fanciest neighborhood in Sacramento, right along the American River, all the high-dollar neighborhood, you know, real wealthy people live there. We passed out all these flyers, and that afternoon this lady calls and says, do you do windows? And I said, "Uh uh-huh. She goes, how much do you charge? I said, $55. I never looked at the house. But, you know, I'm 17 days sober. I shouldn't even have taken the call. (laughs) And... uh, so, so I get to the, so I get to the house, we get to the house, we drive up and we got a bunch of newspaper and a bunch of, uh, uh vinegar and spray bottles cause we don't have any money for Windex. We're talking, we're talking low, we're talking about no income here. At 47 cents for a bottle of, of vinegar. Uh, and we pull up to this house and this lady has a red Mercedes in the driveway. A red Mercedes. And she's got one of those kind of houses with, with a gate that opens up and you're into an entry and it has a wa- a, a, a fountain. You know, a beautiful fountain. If you know anything about the construction of houses, she had a three-foot overhang with shake roof, with a, with a cedar shake roof. We're talking money, big money, big double doors that open into this, big, big, huge double doors. And my mind saying, God, if I had all this, God, if I had a house like this, if only, if only I had a car like that. You know, I walk into the house and I got in, I went into the living room and, and my, and my, uh, my friend went outside and I, I step into the living room and I step down into that plush carpet, that real plush, plush carpet. My mind said, if you had a house like this, with carpet like this, with a car like that, you, you'd be just fine. You, you'd be just fine. Yeah. You probably wouldn't even need AA, you know? You know, and then and then I noticed that there were five bedrooms in this house, and every one of them had double French doors that led out into a uh, little little garden, little private gardens. Double French doors. Everything was there was windows. We were going to be there for four days washing windows for fifty-five dollars. You know, and so then I got even a worse attitude. I'm like, how do I get out of this? I'll, we should pay this lady fifty-five dollars just to get the hell out of this deal. You know, but then I started thinking, you know, God, God, whatever happened to my life? How come I didn't get a better deal? And how come, you know, I was a queen of the if only club. If only, if only I'd had the right parents. If only I'd, you know, God, fill in the if lonelies. We should have a book on alcoholic if onlys, (laughs) right? And then something happened, and it's a magic, and the first time I ever felt that what they talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous, that feeling of God. I'm in that, I'm standing in that living room in that real plush carpet, and the little old lady came in and she started talking to me about the fact that she couldn't have Diet Coke anymore. And I looked at the lady and I said, I know, I, I can't ever, ever have a beer, even a beer, ever, ever again, not even one little beer. And she goes, she looked at me and I think she could tell by the, the way I expressed that to her, that it was important to me. It was important. And I said, and she said to me, I can never have diet soda. I can't have diet soda. You know, the joy that I get out of drinking diet soda, my doctor's taken it away from me. And she was an older woman. And uh, she started talking to me about thinking about selling her house. or It was so big, and sometimes she felt alone there. And then she started telling me about the only time that her children come to visit her is when they need money. And, you know, they say in AA that you 
are exactly where God wants you to be. And remember when I said early, earlier that we must be present to win? In that moment, I knew that that lady didn't want her windows washed. I knew that she was lonely. And I knew that it wasn't about washing that lady's windows. And it was the first time that I started to have my own little personal experience of a power greater than myself. You know, if you're new, I want you to know that I don't wash windows today. But I'm... But I had to wash the windows. Do you know I had to wash the windows? I listened to a lot of country music. <laughs> I used to be ashamed of that. I have my a name. I have a belt with my name on the back of it. <laughs> you can believe that. And that's like who I am. That's who I am. You know, I love country music. And there's this new guy. I just love his name. is Garth Brooks. And there's a song called The Dance. It's a beautiful song. If you ever get the chance to listen to the song called The Dance, please do. Because I think it's so it's so alcoholic. It's just perfect for alcoholics. It says, you know, our lives are better left to chance. I could have missed the pain, but I would have had to miss the dance. You know, that's what it's about. I had to go, and I had to take my life to that place where I was washing the windows. Just like my brother had to do what he had to do. See, we're on that path. And then when we get here, you know, I got here. I can't say we. I can only say me. I got here, and I had such incredible shame. I had such incredible shame from where I came from. I had such incredible shame. And today I know that what I've, what I've been able to come through and to come here and talk to you about what I've come through is my dance. It's my dance. And you have your dance. And our dances don't look the same and they don't have the same step. But it's very important that you come and share your dance with us because that's the magic of this program. You know, that's how this program works. And it takes a lot of courage sometimes, and this has been my biggest struggle in recovery, is being able to, to really open up. <laughs> Obviously not this morning. Uh, I, I had that moment with that glass, you know, I just, you know, some kind of spiritual thing. You know, I was wondering what a sp- book does a spiritual speaker. There's a woman from Ashtray Tapes. They told me, yeah, I told me you'd be a great Sunday morning speaker. And I said, no, I cuss too much. Isn't it funny how God knows something? God, a power great. Oh, gosh. God, my nose is running. I've just, God. I'm almost done here. I've got a few more minutes. They told me I talked till 1230. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, did that hurt your ears? Are they taping somewhere? here you know let's have some fun you know this recovery is fun it's it's it is fun it is it is the most wonderful thing that has ever happened to me you know uh last it was i don't know when it was it was a few weeks ago i went to uh to santa clara this year in santa clara and it was uh Akipa. actually the, see that guy in the white hat walking across there in those blue pants that's mike he's he's very involved in Akipa and Akipa. and to be honest with you when i got there i didn't know anything about Akipa. Besides, they wanted me to come and talk at Acupaw. And I, but I didn't want them to know that I didn't know. You know how we do that? We don't want them to know we don't know. And, uh, and I didn't know that much about it. I knew it was young people's, but I didn't know that much about it. And, and what happened is I went there and, and I shared and, and, uh, on Saturday afternoon I was in my room and, and I said, I said to myself, I said, self, you're here all alone. They paid for this nice motel room. Maybe you ought to go downstairs and get to know somebody. Like, put your hand out and say hi. And I thought, I said to myself, that's a crazy idea. (laughs) That's the most crazy idea I've ever heard. You know, I'd like to be able to stand up here and share with you old timers and new people that I have no fear. What I did is I got on my knees. And I say, God, give me the willingness to go downstairs for 45 minutes and try to interact with these people and make a new friend. See, I want you to think that I'm nickel slick and I got this thing licked, and I don't. But inside of me, I'm just a scared little girl who's just learning how to live. And I went downstairs, 
And I met some people from Sacramento. And they said, you want to go eat? I said, yes, with my mouth. And my mind said, that's not a very good idea. <laughs> You'll probably get sitting in a bunch of at a place with a bunch of strange people. But I went ahead. I said, come on, God, we can, you know, I've always, wink up at God. Look up and wink at God and say, we can do it. We can do it. And I mean, it sounds silly, right? But it's, it's really what goes on in this alcoholic mind. And I went to dinner with all these people from Akipop. And I learned about the International Conference of Young Peoples that's coming to San Francisco. And they give me a history about it. And they told me about how it's, it'll probably never be here again in my lifetime because I'm older. I'm 36, so it won't be here in my lifetime. Uh, and they started telling me, and, and I got all, all wrapped up in the enthusiasm about it. And they asked me if I would like to get involved and, and help. And, and I said that I would, you know, get involved with the Hispanic Outreach. Out, I have this list, Outreach. But the thing that I want you to know is if you knew, see, I'm just as scared as you are. You know, they talk about, oh, you come here and you reach out. You know, a lot of times I'm sitting in a meeting and I look for that newcomer. Uh, you know, newcomer raises their hand. And, and what, I, what I try to do is use my intuition and, and think, you know, you know, does that person really want me to say hello or not say hello or whatever? And, you know, it's like, oh, Edie, quit figuring it out. Just go say hello. You know, and if I have anything to offer you, it's about learning to reach out and say hello. And reach out and sponsor people. If you're new, it, sponsorship has been the greatest gift that's been given to me. You know, at first, you know, I, I was like a year sober. And my sponsor told me, you know, you're so self-obsessed and so self-centered, and I haven't seen you give your, new, your number to anybody new. So I said, well, do you think I'm ready for that? She goes, yeah, you're ready. You're ready. You've done the steps. You've worked through the steps. You're, you're, you're ready. And I said, well, shouldn't I wait a couple of more years and do the steps a couple of more times? And she said, no, go do it now. So I went up to this lady in my home group. Her name's Jean, and Jean's one of the people that used to pee at the counter, you know, because she had a lot of damage. And I walked up to Jean, and I said, Jean, I'm going to be your sponsor. And, and, and Jean said, okay. Okay, you can be my sponsor. And what happened, see, is I picked Jean. I picked Jean because if I messed up, I knew Jean wouldn't notice. Yeah. Manipulating alcoholic, right? And so I used to sponsor the hell out of Jean. And I used to read to her. Jean would call me at 4 o'clock in the morning from Stockton Boulevard, and that's only eight blocks from my house. And at 4 o'clock in the morning... I would read to Jean from the big book. Now, the other thing that I think is my philosophy is that sponsorship's God's way of tricking you into reading the big book. Because when you start sponsoring people, they ask questions about the big book. So all of a sudden, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'm reading old Jean out of the big book. Isn't, you know, and it's like how, how our higher power kind of tricks us, right? See, what happened is I, I got a couple more people that I sponsor, and I started taking them with me when I would go into lockdown, when, 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 when Jean would get locked up in the, in the nut wards. I would take them with me, and, uh, and, the, and that's how this magic, it takes place, you know. It takes place with one alcoholic sharing with another our experience, strength, and hope, whatever that may be, you know, whatever that may be. You know, I, I got I got sober and I couldn't work. Well, you know, I'm washing those damn windows. You know, I'm not real employable. But uh, I was three years sober, and a friend of mine who who was an architect said, Edie, you know, they're hiring building inspectors for the state. Why don't you to go take the test? And I don't know about any of you, but there's a little voice that goes off in my mind that says, oh, the keys to the kingdom are for that person across the, the way. They're not for you. You know, it's different for you. But I showed up and I took the test for the state of California and I got an 85% on that test. And uh, 85% is really good. And I went to work for the state of California as a building inspector on the new prisons that they're building. I was the first woman to be an industrial, doing industrial construction for the state of California. Now, if you think I'm bragging, it's not about bragging. It's about it's a long ways from washing those windows. It's a long ways from the Fillmore. And it talks about it in the big book that we've been given the keys to the kingdom and we can change our life. We can change our life. And I had dreams and I had goals, but I never thought I could get them. 
you know, I was working there for a while in, in San Diego, and it didn't quite work out. Uh, and I'm not going to get into that. I don't have enough time. But I always wanted to be back in Northern California, and there was a, a job uh, in, at UC Davis uh, for, for an inspector planner estimator at, in the buildings division. And I read it in the paper, and I thought to myself, oh, it's probably too much. I can't get that job. But I said, oh, just send, a, send them an application, you know, get an application. So I did, and I got a job interview, and, and uh, the day I showed up, they gave me a four-page job description, you know, four-page job description. And, and I thought, I read the job description, and I thought to myself, oh, God, you need to give this thing back and get the hell out of here, you know. But that other thing that, 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 that happens is I, I believe what long-term members of Alcoholics Anonymous is pre Preach. Yeah, that's what they did. They did do a lot of preaching. Teach me. Uh, that you, that what you do is, is you look up and you wink at God and you go give him the best sober you, Edie you are today. So that's what I did. You know, I went in there and I'd never been on a panel of five people asking me all these different questions. But I looked at God. I went, I went outside. I read the thing. I winked at God and I went into the interview. And I knew when I left that I had the job. I could just feel it. I could just feel it. I went back and took my five-year chip in my home group, and I told them I'm moving back home. And on Tuesday, they called me and told me I got the job. Right? I've got all the Grand Master keys to, to the University of California at Davis. Now, if you're new, <laughs> you can't believe the places I can get into. <laughs> but also, what's exciting about that is that they trust me. And what's exciting about that for me is that I have integrity today, and I don't have to go and steal anything from them. Not that I don't think about it. I don't know about these people that come and they, you know, I was a liar, cheating a thief when I got here. And people, like, I don't steal today. I was sitting in the doctor's office the other day, and they take you in, and they take your blood pressure, and they do that, and then they shut the door, and they leave you there. I'm there about ten minutes, and I'm thinking, what's in those drawers? <laughs> I'm sober. I'm working the steps, and I'm working with new people, but I'm an alcoholic, and I'm thinking, you know those Band-Aids with that less sticks? I love those Band-Aids. Maybe, maybe, just, maybe just two or three of those Band-Aids wouldn't really hurt anything. Wouldn't really hurt anything. That's the way I think. You know, I don't know. When you get ten years sober, do you never think of stealing? I don't know. I think of stealing, but today I just don't do it. I just don't do it today because I don't want to, you know, I'm, I hate doing those eight step. You know, the worst thing to do is have to make amends in sobriety. Oh, God. Those are worse than the ones that you did when you're, at least when you're drinking and using, you were drunk. You know, it's those ones in recovery. And it's like, I'm not willing to do that. So I don't do the behavior as much. Right? Yep, that's it. As much. And I'm a better person today. You know, and I would like to close. I would like to, uh, I'd like to read to you. That in itself is in a spiritual experience. When I got here, I didn't do that real well. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to read two things to you. Do you mind if I read a couple of little things? Okay. This is page 312 from the big book. It's called The Keys to the Kingdom. The last 15 years of my life. <sighs> God, honey, I'll, hold on. Just breathe. I love this page. I just love it. The last 15 years of my life have been rich and meaningful. Oh. I have had my share of problems, heartaches, and disappointments. Because that is life. But also I've known a great deal of joy. God, I can hardly see. And a peace that is handmaiden of the inner freedom. I have a wealth of friends, and with my AA friends, an unusual quality of fellowship. For to those people... For to those people I am truly related, first through mutual pain and despair, and later through mutual objective and newfound faith and hope. And as years go by, working together, sharing our experience with one another, and also sharing our mutual trust, understanding, and love, without strings, without obligations, we acquire relationships that are unique and priceless. There is no, there is no more aloneness with that awful ache so deep in the heart of every alcoholic that nothing before could ever reach. That ache is gone and never need return again. Now there is a sense of belonging, of being wanted and needed and loved in return for the bottle and the hangover. We have been given the keys to the kingdom. Um, that's my favorite page. And I have this prayer I'd like to share with you, but, I, God, I can't get the, my eyes. 
with my makeup all over my face. Shit. <laughs> Little ego going there, huh? What I want to share with you is a, is a share is a prayer that they closed my in my my home group is all tribes group in Sacramento and I'd like to share this and then I'll sit down. It's called an Indian prayer. Oh, oh, oh great spirit whose voice I oh great spirit whose voice I hear in the winds, whose breath gives life to all all the world. Hear me. I am small and weak. I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in your beauty and make my eyes forever behold the red and the purple sunsets. Make my hands respect the things you have made and my eyes sharp to hear your voice. Make me wise so that I may understand the things you have taught my people. Let me learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. I seek not to be greater than my brothers and sisters, but to fight my greatest enemy myself. So when life fades as a fading sunset, my spirit may come to you without shame. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.